Thank you.
Happy Easter, happy Easter. It is so good to be here with you today. And we've gathered here in this space because we wanna celebrate. We wanna celebrate the truth that Jesus is risen on this Easter. The truth that God loves to take broken, battered, beat up things and make them new. Not just fix them up, but make something new out of them. And I think for us as a community, that means something more this year than maybe it's ever meant in the past. The truth is that God meets us at our lowest, at our most broken, our most vulnerable, steps right into our lives exactly where we are and shows up and creates something new. So I am excited just to be with you this Easter and to celebrate together. So we're gonna sing in just a minute. We're gonna sing, we're gonna worship God. And I wanna encourage you, wherever you are, as we begin to sing and worship together, stand up. Wherever you are, remember this, you serve a God who is worthy of your praise, who is worthy of our honor. So get to your feet. Maybe as families, little kids, you can dance around the room, you can wave your hands, you can praise God with us. And then we're gonna take some time together and we're gonna open God's word. And we're gonna to look together at the story of Easter and you're gonna see yourself in that story. And it is a story of God meeting the world, people, humanity, us, all of us at our most broken and creating something new. So be prepared. We're gonna have a great celebration today. Uh, but before we begin, let's come before God, let's honor God. This is God's space, God's time, not ours. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we are a people this morning whose hearts are filled, God, with gratitude for the truth that you meet us where we are. 
and that you loved us enough to step out of the glory of heaven, to enter humanity as the person of Jesus. And God, to give us a new way, a new life. God, we raise your name high this Easter. We praise you. We glorify you. And God, we just pray that every word that we sing, every prayer that we pray, every moment, God, is focused completely and solely on you, our King, Jesus, who gave his life for us. And thank you, God. Thank you that you take these broken, battered, beat up things and you make something new out of them. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name.
So Jesus, we worship you today. God, as we sing about that story of your journey to the cross, the price that you would pay for us, the pain, the death that you would endure. God, that you, the son of God, would lay yourself in a tomb for us. But that then you would raise again. God, that you would finish the story with victory. And that it's because of your victory that we can claim this story as our own today. God, that we have been raised up again, that we have new life in you. And so today, Jesus, that's why we sing to you. And we thank you for the new life that we have been given in you. We worship you today. You are so worthy of all of our praise, of all the honor and of all the glory. We love you. We pray this all in the name of Christ, amen. Happy Easter, my name's Dale. And in today's scripture reading, we'll be reflecting on the story of Easter morning as it's told to us in the Gospel of John. John writes this in chapter 20, verses one through to verse 29. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they've taken away the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed for until then, they hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go, find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I've seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when the Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord, but he replied, 
I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Well, happy Easter. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm so excited just to be here with you on Easter today. And today we're here to celebrate, to celebrate new life, to celebrate resurrection. We're gonna celebrate the truth that dead things do come back to life, that our God is a God of the impossible. That even when you weren't looking for God, that God came looking for you and that God would go through the pain of Friday just so that you would know that you are loved and seen and known and heard. And I think that is such good news this Easter. So I just wanna like scream it, happy Easter. Just say it out loud right now, just happy Easter. <laughs> and I wonder as you sit here today on this Easter, do you feel like you can kind of like exhale a little bit. You've navigated a lot in this year since last Easter. And I wonder if we can sit in that for a moment. I mean, we've made it here. We've made it this far because a lot has happened in this last year. And we've experienced new ways, navigated new ways of doing school and church and work. You've had some loss, some church hurt. Maybe you've lost people that you love your job, and there are things that we have lost like expectations and hopes about the way that things were gonna be. Maybe this Easter, your faith looks different than it did last Easter. A lot has changed, <laughs> and you found yourself kind of in uncharted waters, and it's like you can maybe in the distance, you're not there yet, but you can see the shoreline. And this year we have really seen just how broken our world is, how broken we are as people. We've been kind of beat up and, and pushed around a little bit. We're tired, <laughs> but the truth is this Easter that our God is a God of love and our God is continually inviting and pursuing and calling and loving you and inviting you into this new thing that God is doing. Because God is doing a new thing in me, in you, in our world, in our culture. God is a God who does new things, brand new things. And I think that's really good news for us this Easter. And so today for Easter Sunday, we're gonna look together at the story of the good news, this beautiful new reality that Easter ushers in. But you know, that very first Easter morning, it wasn't filled with joy and, and hope and excitement. That very first Easter morning, it was filled with grief and with pain and, and with lost expectations. Nothing went the way that they thought that it was gonna go. Do you ever have like a vacation and everything went wrong? You have all these expectations and hopes and dreams about how things are gonna go and nothing goes the way that you planned. Psychologists call it vacation expectation. <laughs> and I remember I took my son to Disney World uh, years ago and I actually hadn't been there since I was 12 years old. So we were super excited to go. And our very first day, we had it planned out like months in advance. We knew the rides we were gonna go on. We knew the path that we were gonna take. We were so excited. And so we get there late at night and we get ourselves checked in. We get our clothes out for the next day. We tuck ourselves into bed early because we're so excited. And right about six o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I kind of hear a rumble of thunder and I see through the window, through the curtain that it's dark outside. And it should have been light because it was 6 a.m. 
And almost immediately, there's someone banging on the door. So I jump out of bed, I run, I look out the peephole, and it's a Disney employee. And he says, tornado warning, don't leave your room. <laughs> Now, there is nothing that strikes fear in the heart of a Northeasterner more than the words tornado warning, because we have no idea what to do when someone says tornado warning. But I had seen the movies, I had heard you're supposed to go get in the bathtub. So I grab him, we run into the bathroom, we get into the bathtub. And we just sit there and wait. And all of a sudden, he starts to cry. And he says, Mama, we're not going to Disney today, are we? And I said, I don't know, baby. Probably not. So as a parent, you want to pivot in that moment, right? Because you want it to be a special day, and it's a vacation day. And so we built this, like, fort between the beds, and we order room service, Mickey-shaped pancakes and bacon and eggs. And we end up just staying in our room all day long, and we're watching Disney movies. And at the end of the day, I was putting him to bed. And he just takes his little hands and he puts them on my cheeks. And he says, Mama, this was the worst day ever, but it ended up being the greatest day ever. And you know how that feels, to have nothing turned out the way that you expected. This year was that kind of year. A whole year of change and mismet expectations and things not going the way that we had planned. And when Dale read us that scripture earlier today, and we heard the stories of the people on Easter morning, we see our story, our reflection in them. Now, it's important for us to remember that at this point in Jesus' life, he had been living for about 33 years on the earth. And his closest friends and followers, they had seen up close, like firsthand, just how incredible and amazing he was. They had heard amazing teaching. They had seen him raise people from the dead and give blind people sight. They'd watched him calm a storm. They'd seen him take bread and fish and break it up and feed 5,000 people. And so for us, in our perspective, this one where we sit in history, we think, well, obviously these guys had so much clarity about who Jesus was and what he was doing. But we can't forget that they thought that Jesus was going to overthrow the oppressive Roman government that he was going to lift the Jewish people out of poverty, that he was going to set them free. And then in the matter of a week, this person who they thought was going to be a king that was going to reign with victory and power, they watched him arrested and then murdered. And all their hopes and dreams and expectations were crushed in that moment. And in our passage this morning, We see, we, we see what they are carrying with them, pain and shame and skepticism. And all of Jesus' friends, they're sort of processing this really profound pain in very different ways. First, we meet Mary Magdalene, and we see this immense grief, this pain and the image of all that we've lost. And she's the very first one who goes out in the morning. She sees the empty tomb. She runs back to her friends. She gets them, and then she just stands there. And it says in John 20, then they went home. Her friends, they left. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying. See, Mary Magdalene was a woman who was viewed by the most powerful people in her society as an outsider. She was seen as a sinner, and they didn't even want Jesus talking to her. And then she met Jesus and she started to follow him and he taught her and he accepted her and loved her just the way that she was. And so I imagine that she must have thought her life was going to be totally different when he was king. I imagine she dreamed about what it was going to be like when Jesus took over that government in Jerusalem that weekend. And then he died and she lost the person that she loved that she cared so much about, the first person who really saw her and cared about her exactly the way that she was. And maybe that's you this Easter. Maybe you've lost someone or something. Maybe you've lost your job or that school that you were so sure that you were going to get into. Maybe you lost your marriage. Maybe you lost your hopes and expectations of what this year was going to look like. And when you sat down this Easter morning, you just sat. And then we meet Peter. Peter's the strong one. 
he's the leader. He's the guy who could do anything. He would defend anyone. And Peter was so sure of himself. And Peter loved Jesus. Peter would do anything for Jesus. And then when Jesus was arrested and Peter wasn't sure if he was going to be killed or arrested himself and he was terrified, he didn't know what was going to happen next, Peter denies Jesus three times. He let down the person that he loved more than anything. He did something he never expected that he would do. And so that morning when Peter runs out to the tomb, he is angry, he is shocked, but he is ashamed. Peter is filled with shame and shame is a liar. Shame will tell you that what is true for other people is not true for you. Yes, there is hope for other people, but not for you. There's community for other people, but not for you. There's second chances for other people and not for you. Yes, Peter, Jesus is alive, but Jesus is not alive for you. And Peter, he, he was the guy who, he got out of the boat and ran to Jesus. He told everybody that Jesus was the Messiah. And then when he was ashamed, what he did was he put distance between himself and Jesus. He ran away. In Peter's shame, he moved away from Jesus. Are you carrying any shame today? Do you feel unfixable, broken, like you've gone too far, like there's no going back? See, what shame will tell you is that there's no hope for you. And that's how Peter felt that very Easter morning. And then there's Thomas. Uh, Even if this is your very first time at church, you've probably heard of Thomas, doubting Thomas. And he's the one that when he was told that Jesus was alive, this is what he says. He says, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Poor Thomas. (laughs) He's gotten really beat up for this moment over the years. But it's so relatable to us because for Thomas, a lot like for us, what's buried between that skepticism is actually pain and trauma. I mean, you can't forget that Thomas too, he thought that Jesus was gonna take over as the king. He thought that Jesus was gonna make Israel a sovereign nation again, that he was gonna set people free. And then when Thomas watched as Jesus died on the cross, Thomas felt abandoned. He felt abandoned by God. He felt abandoned by people. He felt abandoned by his country. Does God even care? Where is God? Does God see what's happening to me? Does God see how much I've lost? Does God care about me? Does God care about my people? I mean, he was shattered in that moment, his faith. He felt totally abandoned. Have you ever had something happen that shattered your faith? Have you ever had something happen that made you skeptical? I I met this woman a few years ago, a young woman, she's a single mom, and she's always just trying to make ends meet. But she worked for a local family, they're a Christian family, and they took her to church and they told her about Jesus, that Jesus would save her. And she loved church, she loved going with them. And one month, she found herself kind of short at the end of the month. She needed like 200 bucks. And so she had to make a decision. Was she going to pay her rent or was she going to pay for her kid's food? And when she told me this story, she had tears in her eyes because she sheepishly went to her employer and said, hey, can you give me advance $200 on next week's pay? And her boss, this Christian woman, said to her, oh, (laughs) um, We can't give handouts, but you should pray about it because God will definitely provide. And for this young woman, what that did was it shattered her faith. And she made a decision in that moment, A, that she was never gonna ask someone for help again, but that she was never gonna cross the threshold of a church again. And she wanted to believe in God, but she felt like she had been abandoned and forgotten by God's people. And it shattered her. She never turned back to God again. And for her, deep within that skepticism that she carried was pain and was trauma. Have you been hurt by someone in the church? 
Has someone in a faith community hurt you or the people you love and care about, and you're starting to question whether anything you learned from them was actually real? Is there hope? Is this faith that I have able to carry me through the darkness that I'm living in? Is, is God even real? Is what they taught me even true? And then we have this moment. It's this moment that's central to our faith in John 20, 15. And it's the very first words that we hear Jesus say. And they're comforting. He says, dear woman, why are you crying? And just like that, <laughs> in the middle of all their lost expectations and their grief and their shame and their skepticism, Jesus shows up and he's alive. And he, he shows up and he's restored. Jesus, who was buried in the darkness of Friday, is now resurrected on Sunday, proving that he is making something so new. And right there in the moment that resurrection is saying to us, it's God saying, look at what I have done through Jesus. This is good. Look at Jesus who turned away from violence and from power. Look at Jesus who made a place for that criminal who was hanging next to him on the cross. Look at Jesus who forgave the people who hurt him. Look at Jesus who was a suffering servant right alongside of you. See, we're getting a glimpse through Jesus of who God is. I mean, this is what God is like. <laughs> and we hear Jesus say in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Or it says, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1, 3, the Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. We cannot miss the profound reality that Easter shows us who God is. This co-suffering God, this suffering servant, a God who doesn't stand far off, but will enter into our pain and our suffering and our grief and our skepticism with us. A God who is not asking us to show up fixed up, but instead a God who is coming to us, meeting us exactly where we are. And in Jesus, we see exactly who God is. Through the cross, we see that what Jesus has done is defeat sin. What Jesus has done is defeat shame, defeat our fear of death. But then what Jesus does is goes and meets his people exactly where they are, meeting them in their grief and their pain and their shame and their skepticism. And he meets Mary and she's devastated. And he lovingly says her name, Mary, I see you. I have overcome grief and death for you. And now I'm going to send you out to go tell the world about me. And he meets Peter and he says, Peter, peace be with you. In perfect peace, there is no shame. Peter, I am going to send you out into the world to tell the people about my peace, about my love. And then he meets Thomas. And he knows just what Thomas needs. He shows him, shows him. And then he says, Thomas, peace be with you. Go and live in peace. You, you don't have to live any more hopeless. You don't have to strive or try or do more or be more. You, I'm, you're, he's inviting you into this journey with him, a journey of peace in your life and your heart and a journey of peace in your community with the people around you. And what Jesus was saying to them that very first Easter and what Jesus is saying to us today is look, I, I know you've been beat up You've been battered, you've been tossed around, you've lost your expectations the way that you thought things were. This has been a really hard year, but still, I am doing something new. But still, restoration is real, resurrection is real, and I am doing something new in you and through you. Join me. 
this is the journey of faith, joining God in this restoration. And God wants it to be personal. God wants to walk with you and know you and transform you, each of us individually and each of us communally, all of us together. It's an invitation to build this kingdom, God's kingdom here on earth. And you're invited, you're welcome, you are wanted. The very last verse that we hear in the reading for today, it should be so encouraging for us. It says this, this is uh, John 20, 29. Jesus told them, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who believe when it's hard to believe. Blessed are those who believe when it's too dark and they can't see their way. Blessed are those who have been hurt and they're not sure whether or not they can trust believing anymore. Blessed are those who find themselves with more questions than answers. Blessed are those who have been hurt by a church and they wonder whether or not all the things that that church told them is true anymore. Blessed are those who believe when they can't see me. You are loved. And you're so invited today into this relationship with a God who sees you and knows you and wants to meet you exactly where you are. And and Jesus says, look, you're gonna have troubles in this world but I have overcome the world. I have overcome your grief. I have overcome your shame. I have overcome your skepticism. Now come and sit down with me at a table and I'll put an arm around you and pull you close and I will show you this new life, this new thing that I'm doing in and through you. You know, as part of a faith community, you're not believing alone. You're not hoping alone. You're not walking alone. We're called to bear one another up, to carry each other. And one of the things that we do together to remember together is we participate in the sacrament of communion. We come to the table together and we sit down and we sit down with our Savior who gave up his life, God who became flesh for us. And we sit at the table together as a community of people, and we walk together, and we talk together, and we do life together. And so today we're gonna come to the communion table together. And maybe you've never taken communion at home before. Uh, It's been kind of one of the gifts of this new reality that we're living in, is that we are bound together, not by space, but by the Spirit of God. And so in just a minute, what you'll do is you'll go out and you'll grab maybe from your kitchen some juice or some crackers and you'll bring it back. And we're gonna take communion, all of us together in just a minute. Remember that those elements that Jesus used in those first times of communion with his followers, they were everyday items. They drank wine every day, they ate bread every day. And what God is telling us, just the same as what we're hearing in this story today, is that God meets us exactly where we are does not have the same requirements and parameters and boxes to check that we place on ourselves. God's just saying, sit down with me. Remember together. So that's what we're going to do together. We're going to remember. Remember the cross. Remember the sacrifice. And then remember the new thing that God is doing in and through each and every one of us. So go ahead and and grab your elements and then Come back and sit down. It says in the Gospel of Matthew, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. 
Let's eat together. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood that establishes the covenant. It is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. God, we come before you today, people with thankful hearts. It has been such a long year, God. Really unimaginable as we entered this holy week, as we entered Easter Sunday, God. When we look back at what has happened, at how much we have lost, at how much things have changed, Father. And God, we are so grateful for what you showed us today through your word. Thank you for the reminder, the reality that you are a God who enters into our mess, who shows up in our pain, who doesn't expect us to come fixed up or better or best, God, but instead you meet us just as we are. God, we thank you that you are a God who has given us the promise of life. Thank you that you are a God who has defeated grief and pain and shame and skepticism and sin and death. God, we are grateful that we are a people who praise a God like you. And so God, thank you. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the promise of restoration, of reworking, of renewal. God, thank you for the new thing that you are doing in and through us. May we be people who are constantly open and surrendered to the work that you wanna do through us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. Happy Easter. <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Easter. And remember that this story, the story of hope, the story of new life, the story of God making something new, that's a story for you. And so if this Easter, maybe you just feel like you need someone or would love to have someone to pray with, we would be honored to pray with you. You can go to our website, www.arestoration.church. There's someone there who can pray with you. Or you can email me, amy at arestoration.church. I would be honored to pray with you this Easter. It's good to be with you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Easter. And we'll be back here next Sunday to worship together. Take care, everybody.